We're here on the misty Neolithic site of Armingall Henge, and here is our guide Andy to show us around. Andy Hutchinson, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, welcome to the um, Armingall Henge 2022 excavations, and we're actually standing here on the on the top of the Henge Bank, and if we look in this direction, um, you might just be able to see there's a green a green mark. A curved green mark coming around there. That's the Henge's outer ditch. And then over here, we can see uh, another green mark, a wider green mark with weeds growing up out of it. And uh, that's the Henge's inner ditch. So we're actually on the bank. We're standing on what, uh, it doesn't look like much of a bank now, but um, it was a bank in the Neolithic. Um, we'll head over to the, the centre of the Henge, um, but before we do, it's worth probably just pointing out this plan uh, drawn in 1935 by J.G.D. Clark, who excavated the Henge. Um, and it shows the excavation area that um, was undertaken then this is our excavation area. So what we've done essentially is we've, we've re-excavated um, much of the area that, that was excavated by Clark in 1935. And our goal really was to, to understand better the, um, the dating of several of the, of the features. Uh, and we'll have a look at whether we've achieved that goal as we as we walk round, uh, but we'll start with the um, we'll start with the timber circle, the timber setting. It's more of a horseshoe really than a than a circle, and it's just over here. So we'll we'll walk on in that direction. So we're coming down off the bank here. We're actually crossing what um, is the inner ditch and coming up to the excavation area um, and the area that the timber settings can be seen in. So we'll, we'll walk up onto our, um, our spoil heap. And actually the spoil heap can help you imagine perhaps to some extent what the, um, what the bank was like. Um, when it was being when it was being constructed, but our spoil heap is linear. It follows the edge of the trench. But if you, if you imagine this kind of going round and curving round the the edge of the henge, um, that that would be the kind of thing that the bank um, would have looked like to start with, um, and then and then eventually it would have grassed over and um, and stabilised and just become a grassy mound. So can I ask Andy, yeah. why a uh, timber henge, why not megaliths like at Stonehenge? Um, well most, uh, most of the, um, the, the sort of uh, circles uh, that, that consist of, um, of settings from the Neolithic are timber, not, not stone. There are obviously a few stone ones around. I think um, timber was, um, was, was a, a, an easier uh, medium to work with. It's um, more portable, often, than, uh, than stone is. Um, also, in somewhere like uh, this part of the world, East Anglia, uh, there is no, no readily available stone. So the nearest stone outcrops are hundreds of miles away. So they probably didn't really have any choice here but to use timbers. But these timbers, as we, if we swing over, you can see post hole three in the, um, in the, the distance farthest one yeah. over there, the fur furthest, furthest post hole. Um, now that, that's um, a little bit bigger than its original size because, um, because the excavators in 1935 excavated out from it. But it gives you an indication as to how big these, um, these post holes are and hence how large the, um, the posts themselves were. Um, the posts were a metre 
in diameter and um, possibly as tall as 10 meters in height from the ground up and they were dug into the ground two and a half meters or a little bit over two and a half meters so absolutely huge timbers and weighed somewhere in the region of five and a half tons each so to get those into this location um, they would have had to have um, moved them I think on rollers and we know from the 1935 um, work and our own work here now that each of these post holes has a ramp associated with it um, and the ramps you can see down down in the um, excavation area um, you can see it coming off one one side and it looks a little bit like a a, a, a banjo um, so <laughs> the ramp is the bit that's um, the, that's the long long linear bit coming off the side of the post hole and I think those ramps were important um, in order to get the post into the hole because they were so huge so it would have helped in terms of setting the post and then the post would have been winched up using some kind of A-frame I guess um, with block and tackle but a mammoth um, task pulling a a, a, a huge timber like that into into place and then packing around it so that it's so that it's fixed yeah. um, and doesn't and doesn't move how many people do you think would have been involved in something like that um i think i think probably quite a few um uh, these places generally speaking are thought to be um locations for gatherings so you know uh, bringing together um communities from a, a quite a wide uh, geographical area so I think I think we'd be looking at maybe hundreds perhaps of people um, we have calculated that uh, the Henge Bank um, would have it was large enough to uh, to enable around about 2,000 people to stand on it uh, at any at any one time um, and that would have focused attention on the on the middle of, of the monument so the, um, the, the ramps are also indicative of, of another um, aspect that's quite important, I think, um, in that to get those massive timbers in to the area, uh, it would have been very, very difficult to do if the inner ditch and the bank had existed at the time that the, the posts were brought in. So we think, therefore, that the timber setting is the first, um, the first event in terms of the, the, the monument. So the timber setting was here before the rest of the, the, the monument, before the actual henge itself. The henge technically consists of an di inner ditch and a bank, and in this case also an outer ditch. So that's, and we don't have a, a, a real feel for how long um, the timber settings, the timber circle, might have been here before the hinge was built. But we, we should be able to find that out um, because we've, we've got some material down in um, post hole two. We can probably just about see from here over the fence. We have um, charcoal going down the side of the, um, of the post hole or the post pipe itself now the post pipe is where the um where the post actually was and then the rest of this is a an area of packing and that's the ramp the post ramp going off in that direction this is a drawing of post hole three the one excavated in the uh, the far one um back in 1935 and what's interesting about this is that we're finding exactly the same pattern um uh, in post hole two as was found in post hole three in 1935 right down to the fact that there are burnt areas at an angle um, coincident with where the post ramp was and that's something we, we, we're yet to fully explain we're not quite sure what was going on there but the current theory I think is probably that it, it reflects the post being removed um, at the end of the um, at the end of its um, life, and um, that 
process of removal has, has left that pattern of, of burnt material and, um, and, and charcoal. And possibly that's because the post was burnt um, when it was standing, which would have required quite an, an enormous amount of um, kindling um, and, and small scale flammable material in order to make a big post like that um, uh, set fire. So the other aspect I think that's worth pointing out at this point is, um, is the monument, both the timber circle and the henge are both focused essentially on the southwest. Um, and the south from here, if we look directly southwest, we would, if the trees and hedges weren't here, be able to see a hill called Chapel Hill. And Chapel Hill, um, if you were to stand here on the um, midwinter solstice and watch the sunset, you would see the sun moving down the side of Chapel Hill and going down into the river valley, which is, which is over in, in that direction. So we think that's probably one of the kind of key significant aspects of the location and why um, people in the Neolithic felt that it was it was a place to, to build firstly a timber circle and then and then later a henge. Graham Clark um, in the 1930s was able to collect some charcoal from post hole seven which is over beyond um, our excavation area. And, um, and he kept that charcoal uh, and eventually it was um, deposited in the, in the Castle Museum here in, in Norwich. And, um, and about 25 years later, um, Graham, uh, sorry, uh, Rainbird Clark, who was curator at the Castle Museum, had a correspondence with the um, with Gail Seedking, who is cu a curator at the British Museum, about dating the timber circle using um, charcoal that that had been collected 25 years earlier. When the charcoal was collected, radiocarbon dating hadn't um, hadn't been invented uh, or hadn't been discovered. Um, but it was by the 1950s, and so by 1960. They were able to um, they were able to send the charcoal off to the British Museum lab uh, for dating, and the date came back, um, and it has now been calibrated, and gives us a date range of 3,525 BC through to 2,700 BC, which is a very wide uh, range of possible dates for the for the monument which is something that we're keen to refine. Um, so we want a more precise date. And we think that, that the charcoal material in post hole two that we just looked at will give us that, that, um, that option. It will give us the ability to, um, to redate the, the, the timber settings. Um, and there is a little tiny sliver of material, probably original Neolithic material, left at the bottom of post hole three. And again, we might be able to collect enough um, datable materials from that deposit to, to date that post hole as well. And that'll give us two post hole dates. If we move along, we might actually be better off, um, to be honest, going down the spoil heap. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and do that just over here. So just to orientate, um, we, we are now standing about here, just looking out over the inner ditch. And we can see the inner ditch um, section, cross section through it. Um, and you can see the layers that have um, been deposited throughout the, ditches, um, throughout the ditch's lifespan. Right at the bottom, we've got um, some really really well-defined dark banding um, and that contains charcoal chunks of charcoal and also contains um, burnt flints so we we 
think that that material, because it's also scorched to some extent the surrounding um, uh, soil matrix, that that material perhaps went in hot to the uh, to the to the ditch, and um, that's again quite significant um, in terms of dating. We'll be able to um, obtain charcoal samples, which will allow us to to date um, that deposit and fortuitously that deposit is right at the bottom of the ditch so will give us a good handle on the possible the, 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 the original date for the excavation of the ditch um, above that we've got um, we've got an accumulation of silts and and also eroded um, material probably eroding from the bank um, and up to about um, a third of the way up that's all prehistoric and then from about um, a third up to about two thirds and we can show you that's the outer ditch hold on on here this is this is again um, the 1935 section drawing and you can see here there's the burnt material again and then we've got this set of deposits so, which are labeled four, six, and seven on the section drawing. Those are all, we think, prehistoric. Three um, is Roman in, in date. There's quite a lot of Roman material coming out of three. So between the bottom of the ditch and the bottom of deposit three um, is about um, two and a half or 3,000 years. And then three to one is the last circa 2,000 years. So the whole ditch has taken around about 5,000 years to fill up to the, the, the top and to become just a crop mark. And the processes behind that are complicated and, um, and long-term. Um, ditches tend to consolidate quite, um, quite quickly. And once they're grassed in, um, they'll stay stable for long periods of time. So probably up until the Roman period, it was, it was a very slow accumulation, it would seem. And then perhaps um, a, 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 a rather quicker accumulation in the Roman period. And then, um, and then again, stability for a while before perhaps modern ploughing has, um, has filled in the top of the ditch. So we'll go along and have a look at the the bank, which is just over here. That's about two metres of depth overall, isn't it, Andy? Um, it's just yeah, it's just over actually. Um, this is a that's a th three, three metre scale, so yeah, it's about two. Let's call it two seventy. Sure. So. When the, um, when the ditch was excavated, the material from it, we think, was um, thrown up onto here, which formed the, um, the bank for the hen. But as you can see now, um, very little of that bank survives. And what we're trying to explore here is, is just the base of uh, what was the bank. And we think we have, um, we think we have a, 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 an earlier, Set of um, deposits that predate the bank, the bank being put put up or constructed, and um, that uh, that's quite useful. So again, we'll be able to um, take samples from from that um, that material, and that hopefully will give us a date for um, for the material predating the bank. Um, that's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, and you can imagine, again, that the bank would have been much, we think, would have been much higher. But it is a very wide bank. Um, uh, so it's quite mysterious um, why it's eroded as completely as it, uh, as it has. So more work, I think, in terms of analysis of the constituents of the bank will be needed before we've got a, a good understanding of the processes that have gone into its um, formation. And what are the constituents? Well, the constituents mostly seem to be um, gravel right. um, from excavation of the, the ditch. 
but over here we might have potentially some turf as well so it may be that part of the area was stacked turf and then we've got gravel um, deposited on top of the stacked turf that's a possibility and um, this is the outer ditch the outer ditch is um, it's quite a lot smaller than the the inner ditch in terms of its width and depth and um, Clark in the 1950s was able to um, was able to excavate this ditch but we think that he probably did, didn't get the bottom of it and we now um, believe that we have um, reached the base uh, he excavated just down to the bottom of a silt layer uh, which he called five and we can see that silt layer like a gray part there and, yeah the gray in the section and then below that there's this um, this interesting and unusual set of cobbles um, flint pebbles that have seemed to have been set into the base of the ditch so that's quite intriguing and we think that that's mirrored actually over in um, the uh, inner ditch as well but survives a little bit less well um, so we're not quite sure why um, flint pebbles would have been set into the base of the ditch um, it, but it's an interesting phenomenon and one that we'll be looking for some parallels for um, so that's that's intriguing if we um, if we move in this direction we'll, um, we'll go and have a look at um, some of the work that we've been doing in the surrounding valley to try and understand the the um, topography um, and to understand the the geological sequence here so we've done some um, test pits um, we've got one I'll find it we've got one here which we filled in again and this test pit showed um, that there was quite a shallow soil down onto a um, onto a terrace gravel so a, a, a glacial period terrace gravel and then again that's the case in this test pit too so we've got continuity across here but then what we've discovered is that, that it changes dramatically between here and about four meters five meters over here as we go into the valley and in this test pit we had a very deep soil um, much deeper than the other two so we think now that there may have been a, a kind of escarpment going round where the, um, the henge is, um, is situated and that escarpment um, would have been quite an accentuated um, geological feature that would have made the henge much more dramatic to view from the valley itself and we that's probably quite important because most people will have arrived we think at the Henge by boat. Um, the, the, the valley is the confluence of two rivers, the Taz um, and, the, um, and the Yare. And so that's, that's quite a significant um, location. It's also not far from another confluence with, with another river, the Wenson. So the intake um, of, of, of area, as it were, um, that people could access um, the, the Henge from is quite wide in terms of traveling um, by, by river in, in, um, in small boats. And um, I think that the, 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 the river is a significant feature here, therefore, and it's a, it's a significant feature not only in terms of making it, um, making it convenient um, and accessible the area it's also I think a feature in terms of again the way that the Sun sets um, on the midwinter solstice it comes down Chapel Hill as you recall I said earlier uh, into the river valley so there's that relationship if you like between the Sun uh, the, and the river as well as um, as well as other monuments in the location um, and so I, the, the topography here 
kind of accentuates, I think, the importance of this, of this location. And the other um, important uh, sort of uh, landscape aspect here is that um, if, you, if you do a 360 degree turn through, um, the Henge is sat below higher ground pretty much on all sides. So that's, I think, another significant perhaps reason for the Henge being located on this this terrace of, of gravel overlooking these, these important river connections. And um, we've also done some auger samples um, across the valley to try, and, um, to try and establish whether there are any uh, riverine deposits because we wanted to try and tie in um, alluvial deposits with, with the Henge. And actually in the field that we're working in, um, we've discovered that, in fact, there are no um, there are no riverine deposits. They're all terrace gravels, all the way over to where the current river is located. But the current river has been um, canalised. It canalised when the when the railway went. And the railway is just um, just at the edge of our um, our area here. Um, and looking over in that direction, we can see that the the trees beyond the railway are in fact lower than the, this part of the, um, the valley here. So that's where the, the, the river was originally and that's where the confluence would have, would have been. So um, uh, this part of the area always stays dry, it's not in the, it's not in the floodplain. And we can show you the, um, the soil, the depth soil over here in this this part of the, the dry valley as it were. So in this test pit we can see we have quite a deep soil uh, and we think that what we've got represented here is um, material that's washed downhill from the henge and the slow process of that, that washing um, has filled in the escarpment and made it quite a gentle slope. So if we look up uphill, it's now um, a fairly gentle slope up. But in the past, there would have been a, 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 a much more sort of a much more dramatic drop of slope, just just as you um, just as you view the henge. So just before just before the henge. Um, there would have been that dramatic um, sloping. So making the, the Henge quite a, a, a dramatic monument as viewed from the river valley down in that direction. And then the last um, aspect that we're looking at is, um, is over here. And we can see um, we can see both on aerial photographs, but also um, on ge the geophysical survey that, that was done back in, in August. We can see the, the henge outlined very well. And over here, there's a, there's a second circle in the field that we can go and have a quick look at. And this second circle is, um, is a... Uh, is a barrow, or it would have been a barrow um, at the time, um, at, well, in, in prehistory. So, in the early Bronze Age, um, there are a number of barrows constructed in this landscape, and this this is this is one of them. Um, this one happens to um, be in the same modern field as the Henge, and. Um, consists really just of a, of a ditch and in this case the ditch is quite small which suggests that we don't have a big bowl-shaped round barrow here but rather perhaps maybe a pond barrow or maybe or perhaps a dish barrow so um, one that isn't um, isn't as high in the um, in the landscape as as some barrows uh, are and which you know which can be seen in, in parts of the country where they survive well 
Sparrows don't tend to survive very well in um, East Anglia. Um, they seem to have um, often been ploughed out if they're um, in areas that have become agricultural. And there are more um, barrows surrounding the hen. Two more uh, over to the north where we have an electricity substation. Um, one which was excavated in the 1950s and then again in the 1960s and was dated, um, radiocarbon dated, to around about 2400 through to about uh, 1800 BC. Um, and um, that big barrow that was excavated had two ditches um, and was, um, was subject to a number of, of, of burials. Um, so people returned to that um, barrow on a number of occasions and buried perhaps um, family members who were, um, you know, who, were, who were important in some way within this landscape or, or who you know, returned to this landscape time and time again for um, perhaps meetings at the, uh, at the Henge. Um, in the field opposite, uh, on the other side of the, the, the road, we have another two barrows. And then to the south again, we've got um, we've got several barrows uh, yet again, and that's all kind of part of a, a, a ritual landscape here. Arming Hall seems to perhaps be at least one of the earlier monuments in that in that landscape. There's another henge um, down the river from here, about 700 meters, at a place called Markshaw, and um, that is a smaller. Henge and, and interestingly, um, Arminghall, Markshall Henge, and the big, um, the big uh, double ring ditch barrow in uh, in the under the electricity substation all seem to be in an alignment. Um, so, yeah, a, a, a big intervisible um, monumental landscape here, similar to the ones that you can see. In, um, in places like Wiltshire, where the survival um, is, 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 is much better um, and where most of the monuments haven't been ploughed out like they have been here, um, just to the south of Norwich. So that's, that's essentially the story so far. Excellent. Thanks very much, Andy.